I had been interested in photography from the time I was 10. Uh, by the time I was 12, uh, 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 of course, my family thought, oh, it's just another hobby. But uh, by the time I was 12, I knew that photography was going to be my life. I, I didn't know what that meant, obviously. It was, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I didn't know whether I was going to be uh, doing uh, weddings and bar mitzvahs. And, uh, you know, I, I, who knew, you know, 12 years old. But I knew that I wanted to stay with photography and uh, that I loved it. And it was something that gave me a great deal of pleasure. Uh, when I was 14, I was sitting in my living room one afternoon, and there was an empty lot next to my house in the north side of Chicago, and uh, a, a man drove up in an old Jaguar, uh, got out. I noticed the car was filled with stuff, and he got out, and he had a light meter on his belt, and I ran out of the house. He had a, he had a cap on and a beard and a smoking a pipe, and in those years, it, you know, that's like... Uh, uh, very unusual, you know, for uh, mm -hmm. suburbs of Chicago. And I ran outside and I said, hi, my name is Steve. I live next door. What kind of light meter is that? And he said, uh, son, we'll have a lot of time to talk about that. I'm building a house next door to you. And he built his house and became my mentor. Uh, mm -hmm. He was a CBS newsreel cameraman um, and uh, also owned part of the News Film Lab in Chicago. In those days, of course, news was all done on film. And uh, he, was, uh, he was very, very influential in my life. And, um, but uh, what he did was he insisted that I learn still photography before I ever start in movies, which uh, I think at this point in my life was one of the best things that ever happened to me. So, well, be um, because, because there, there, there is definitely... Obviously, in so many positions in the in the film industry, and certainly cinematography, there is the technical aspect of the art form, but there's also the the visual storytelling element. So uh, I, you obviously had a great acuity for for visual storytelling from a young age, or did you feel that way? You know, I, I it's it's why it's one of the reasons that attracted to, to me to movies because I like I like telling stories. I wasn't a good writer, and the way I told stories was through pictures. So uh, I think uh, you know that, that's that's very astute of you. Well, uh, I'm looking over your resume and so many of your earlier earliest credits when you were doing second unit work and that sort of thing. Uh, my goodness, you, you got off to a flying start <laughs> in the industry. So many of these are just astounding credits. Uh, how did you. you how did you break in? What was that first breakthrough for you? Well, I I worked um, I, I worked in Chicago for the first I'd say ten years of my career. In fact, uh, I was uh, finishing up my degree at the Illinois Institute of Technology at the Institute of Design which was a, a great design school and a great photography school. Uh, uh, it was the American Bauhaus. And um, I went in for a job uh, as an assistant cameraman uh, because I had already been doing that a little bit for, for people, and I worked in still photography studios. I was still a senior in college, and I showed a little film that I had done in college to uh, a, a, a man who had just, uh, recently passed away, named Mike Gray, who was a wonderful documentary filmmaker and director uh, and writer. Uh, he wrote China Syndrome, amongst other things. But at the time, we were just doing commercials, and he looked at this little film that I did and said, well, you know how to light. And I said, well, I was at Art Center in Los Angeles. I studied lighting. I've been a photographer since I was 10. Yes, I do know how to light. He said, well, we're, we'll hire you as a cameraman. Uh, and, and I said, okay, I'm a cameraman. And from that point on, I think I was 21 years old, I, I, I never looked back from that. And uh, uh, it was a great opportunity because I was doing national commercials at 21 years old. Uh, and uh, they wanted me because they were all cinema verite documentary people. And uh, they weren't that concerned with lighting, but they wanted to do these national commercials. And I um, uh, fit right into their their uh, their scheme. So I was there. 
I wasn't there that long because the business kind of fell apart a bit and they needed to to get rid of me. I was the low man on the totem pole. But I hung around and spent a lot of time with, with those guys. And uh, some of them uh, formed a, a documentary co-op called uh, Cartemquin Films in Chicago uh, uh, that is still one of the... Uh, Longest running, oldest uh, documentary co-ops in 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 America, if not the world. Um, they've been responsible for such things as hoop dreams and uh, many other wow. great yeah. great documentaries. So, so that was that was kind of the crowd I was in. Does the documentary form um, is it very valuable as a training ground to kind of teach you how to think fast on your feet? Absolutely, and and uh, of course, it, in those days we were carrying, you know, forty, fifty pounds of camera on our shoulders, and uh, it was not as 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 easy as it is today to uh, run around with cameras constantly doing, you know, I mean now what we have is, is that same format in uh, uh, in not in cinema verite documentaries. But in reality shows, uh, and and it's it's a great training ground to to think on your feet. It it it, it was interesting because I took a, a, a position that um, I wanted to uh, bring more production value to uh, the the concept of documentaries and cinema verite. So my ability to see light really helped me in that because I could go into a room. I, 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 I developed the concept of uh, what I call the power spot. Um, and and every in every situation, every room and every space, you can go in and you can find the most, um, the, the most powerful spot in the room where you can really observe everything going on and uh, of course it's it's fluid it changes but at, at time depending on the you know where people move to and what's going on but there's always the, there's always a good position to see what's going on and to observe the light that's that's falling on people and to make the best of it and to uh to increase the production value on uh, on on some of these productions, and I'm still doing that. I mean, I uh, just designed a, uh, a, a, a a webcast and documentary uh, for the Van Cliborn Piano Competition, um, and uh, the idea that I came to that I didn't I didn't shoot it. I was just uh, kind of set it up and designed it. Um, uh, and and the idea that I had there was how do we raise the production value um, in in a way that uh, makes it look much more professional, and we did, and I'm very mm. proud of that too. So I, I still think in those terms. This is something that I'm curious about because you say that there's always a, a, a perfect angle at which to capture something, um, but at any given moment is the trick with documentaries though to achieve that and yet not be too intrusive because if you right. are intrusive uh it kind of breaks the reality of that situation as it's happening in some way yes but you know when, when somebody has a camera on their shoulder there's always an influence of that camera i i, I think the cameras cameras eventually become a character in the movie you know the 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 camera itself becomes a, a a character. So when I was doing my documentaries, you know, in terms of uh, the the cinema verite style, um, I would insinuate myself into a situation because I don't think the camera is neutral, and uh, sometimes I would even question the uh, people from behind the camera as I was shooting. Uh, so uh, I, I think that you know you can't you you can maybe someone like Frederick Weissman you know who who does these great documentaries can uh, mm -hmm. uh, can get away with being somewhat invisible but e even so you know because he goes in for months without film and just sits there and people get used to him and and he gets astonishing stuff that way but I still think that there is some influence that the camera must have. 
Sure. So in these early years, did you have opportunities to observe and study how people like Vilmos or Mr. Cronenwith, how, how, how they worked? Oh, of course. <laughs> what a great <laughs> opportunity. These were these were tremendous opportunities for me on on close encounters when I when I got that um I was there, there was a uh a, um a division in uh the unions, the labor unions in in the film business and that division was that there were three territories in America that were different unions or different uh, locals of the same union. And um, because of that, there were rules that if somebody came from California, they had to have someone from uh, the central region, what we call the Chicago region at that time, uh, to match them. So on Close Encounters, for instance, I was uh, hired to match Vilmos just as a body, uh, it was kind of uh, uh, an interesting situation. It doesn't exist today because now we are all three locals are one local, Local 600, the International Cinematographers Guild. So that doesn't happen the same way. You don't put standbys on. So I was kind of hired as a, as as the Chicago standby. And the first few weeks I was there, Steven Spielberg didn't even let me touch a camera. And uh, finally one day he said... Um, he said, "All right, uh, uh, we're, we're shooting the party scene in the backyard of, of these these uh, suburban houses in Mobile, Alabama." <clears throat> and he said, uh, "Take a camera out and, and and show me what you can do." And from that point on, I was <clears throat> part of the production team, and uh, I was able to uh, do a, a, an awful lot of stuff for them and uh, become the second unit director of photography on Close Encounters. Wow. Yeah, wow. And, and, and in fact, uh, I had my first day as a grown-up DP on Close Encounters because um, Vilmos had been, his crew had been rigging the big set, the the uh, dirigible hangar that was, uh, or it was a C-47 hangar from World War, War II. It was a huge, huge interior space, and they had been working on this uh, uh, this set and the, and the lighting of it, uh, or the rigging of it for four months, and they wanted Vilmos to just walk in and start shooting. And he said, I can't do that. I need to get in there and spend a little time turning lights on and aiming them. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, we can't stop production for that. So, uh, uh, And, and what, they, what they did was they figured he would never agree to this. So they said, if you give the first unit to Stephen Poster, uh, for the day, you can go and spend the day uh, with your gaffer and uh, on the big set. So they, they were very generous to give him one day, but they didn't think he was going to accept me taking over the first unit. But of course, Vilma said, "Sure, absolutely." <laughs> and uh, my first day, of course, I had shot commercials and documentaries and educational films and industrial films and all that. But but my first day on a big feature as a director of photography was the evacuation scene uh, where there were uh, throngs of people in a train and, and, and herds of chickens and cows and, uh, and uh, horses. And, <laughs> and, and I had a, a, a Titan crane and I had arc lights and things, tools that I had never really used before. Um, but uh, uh, I uh, managed to accomplish that day, and that was my first day as a grown-up DP. And, of course, the, the confusion became that, that the director was named Stephen, and I was named Stephen. So every time somebody would say, you know, Stephen, we would both turn around. It was kind of a funny situation. But that was wow. it, and, and I never what, what a What a... What a massive undertaking! I mean, to be to be in the middle of that atmosphere. I've heard the the kind of the horror stories about trying to light that massive set. Uh, it's, it's really impressive. Um, I, I want to ask you about one of your earliest films that you that you were the director of photography on, and that's uh, Someone to Watch Over Me, uh, which is a Ridley Scott's film. Yep. Um, and of course, he is one of the most visually splendid directors out there and this this movie feels like a noir 
Um, did did you? Uh, did, yeah. Did you apply those visual techniques uh, in, in this film? Yeah. It, it, let me let me tell you about Ridley. It, it, Ridley came out of, uh, out of as an artist came out of, of of art direction and commercials, and and his his main thrust was 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 art direction and brilliant at that. Absolutely brilliant. Um, so, so as a, in in the, the photography side, he was a collaborator, uh, and uh, really gave me a tremendous amount of of, uh, of of freedom as long as I could keep up with him. He, he, he's he's an amazing thinker. He has a, a, an amazing mind, and uh, he would come in and and give you an idea for a setup, and then you could do something that and show him and then he would kind of modify it a little bit and then you could modify it a little bit and and it it was a it was a wonderful collaboration in that sense and uh he uh he gave me uh, uh because he had met me on on Blade Runner uh when I was doing additional photography for him uh which is also an interesting story of how I got that um uh he he gave me a, a a tremendous amount of freedom and uh, 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 the ability to collaborate with him as long as I could think as fast as he did. Mm. So, uh, is there in a film of that style, uh, that kind of noir style, um, it really deals heavily, as that genre of films do, with with definitely light and shadow in a very special way. Do you do you apply? Maybe techniques that were used in in black and white photography to to the color photography in that film. You know, it's a, it's an interesting question. I I think that the two are very uh, are, are are not separated in my mind. And in fact, today most of my in fact almost all of my still photography is black and white. Um. I, I, I'm, a, I'm also an art photographer and have had museum shows and gallery shows around the country, and uh, but it's all black and white. So in today's world, when you shoot uh, um, digitally, even though you're going to end up in black and white, you shoot color mm. and you convert it to black and white. There happens to be one camera now that is a pure black and white digital camera. But but in in fact most of the time you're shooting color, thinking in black and white. So to me it, it's not that uh, um, it's not that that different, you know, because uh, I'm I'm just I'm I'm seeing the picture uh, in my mind as black and white, even though we're shooting color. So I I don't think that uh, it, it's it's a matter of being able to see light. That's mm-hmm. the key. You know, you can teach someone how to where to put lights and everything, but they're not. You're not going to teach them how to see light. You have to learn how to see light. You've done a, a fair share of comedy work as well. I know. I love uh, and, comedy. And I, everyone I talk to from all different kinds of disciplines, whether it be acting or directing or writing, they all talk about how tricky comedy is. Is it equally tricky to photograph? I think it, uh, you know, it, it's doing it well. I, I think is is every bit as hard as as doing any kind of drama. Um, it's it, I never liked the idea that oh, comedy is bright, you know. And it's not that you're going to do a noir comedy. You, you you really you know do have to approach it differently. But I think that there is every bit of of of, uh, of aesthetic in terms of the lighting as as there would be for for any other kind of movie and in fact if you look at some of the comedies that that i've done um that i think are are the most successful uh like for instance life stinks with mel brooks Mm -hmm. it it has a, a much more distinctive look than than those studio comedies that just say well light it up let let them see it um, and I, I think that, uh, um, in fact, that, that you choose when you when you when I start on a on a project, um, I kind of uh, uh, want to 
go through all my testing and developing of ideas and technical stuff and, and get that out of the way, and then I, I, I want to shoot intuitively. And and uh, the the intuition that I have is telling stories with light and composition and movement, uh, and and that takes over whether or not it's a style that uh, fits with the. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it always has to fit with what the director wants in terms of telling the story, and uh, it has to fit with uh, what the production can afford. Uh, but of course, my job has always been, even from the earliest part of my career, as I said, is to uh, to bring more production value to to something, no matter what the cost is, of uh, uh, no matter what the budget is. Uh, work within that budget to to trick people into much better production value than they thought they could have in the first place. <laughs> so well, it's, it's kind of my game. And uh, in fact, I have a, a method of working with directors that uh, um, that I've I've developed over the years. And and, and 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 as I said, I want to I want to eliminate the technical from my thinking and just work intuitively. One of the very first movies that I did that com- with, with that I feel was completely successful in that method was Donnie Darko. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. Uh, um, I I took that job because of the script. I thought the script was brilliant. And Richard was, uh, I think, around 23 at the time. And uh, uh, I I said, I will do this movie under the condition that Richard and I can have three or four days alone together talking about the script. And they agreed to that. And when we started that process, I, of course, walked in the room and I noticed that Richard was kind of nervous and pacing around a bit, and I, I said, wait a minute, stop a second. Okay, from this point on, you and I are the same age. You don't consider that I am you know, more experienced or anything. Or I am just here to help you tell the story. And I could noticeably see him relax, and we started getting into it, and we read the script to each other in ways that we totally... Uh, broke it all down in in our minds as to what story we wanted to tell with every scene. What did we want the audience to understand? I believe that that every frame of every movie informs the audience. And uh, when you when you have that concept, you have to think about what what it is you're telling the audience with every image. And it's worked very well for me. It worked very well on Donnie Darko, and it's worked on every other movie since then. Well, and your work with Mr. Kelly um, has afforded you uh, an obvious freedom of experimentation. Uh, I mean, these these each of these films they present their own unique challenges, and they're all just incredibly stunning uh, to watch. Um, I, I know one of our one of our co-hosts, one of his very favorite movies is Southland Tales, and oh, and I love I, hearing that. I love that movie, and and it's so misunderstood. <laughs> Yes, yes. It really is. Uh, it was a, a, an absurdist political commentary that, that that was not sold that way, and I think it was a huge mistake. When you're, if you could just just quickly speak about the you, the challenges unique to uh, uh, Southland Tales and something like The Box, which is a movie that I really adore and has a very special feeling. That movie. Um, w- what were the challenges unique to those for you? Well, on Southland Tales, um, it, 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 it was a, a kind of um, homage to uh, to those kind of beach movies, you know, and, and, in the sense that uh, um, it, it really all took place within that that you know kind of sunny Southern California, you know, beach. Uh, nothing nothing bad can happen in that kind of light, you know. But in mm-hmm. fact, it was. <laughs> and, uh, um, it, 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 it was uh, a, a very interesting. We, we shot that. Uh, we, we did that movie in 27 days. And now, for anybody wow. who knows movie schedules, that was very, very fast for the amount of stuff that we, we did. Um, like, for instance, the, uh, uh, the scene that was the music video. Um, and uh, with um, uh, Justin Timberlake, 
um, the producers said to us, you can't do that. You'll never do it in time. It's going to ruin the production. You don't have the time to do that. Stop. Don't, don't even think of doing that. And we said, give us three hours. And in three hours, we created that whole thing. Oh, my so, goodness. Uh, yeah. And if you go back and look at it, it's only four shots. <laughs> four, four or five. Uh, so we, we we really pulled off, you know, kind of miracles on that movie. Uh, for no money at all, and uh, it was it was a great fun. It was a great challenge to do it, and great fun. And Richard and I think so much alike in in terms of that kind of storytelling. Uh, and and it, in in fact, in the box, um, this was our first digital movie together, mm-hmm. and uh, we wanted to find a way to not make it a digital movie, but make it a movie that, that nobody thought about how it was shot. And uh, I had to develop a look based on that and, um, and, and, and also a look that was a period look. So uh, uh, that was a great challenge and a lot of fun to do. And of course, working it's with a- Cameron Diaz, how, how hard is that? <laughs> yeah, quite quite photogenic that that camera Diaz. Yes, absolutely, and it's a stunning looking movie. Um, By the way, let me just give you one aside. We're about to start our fourth movie together. Are you and really? It, and I think it's well, yeah. We're just waiting for the green light. I'm, I I think it's the best script he's ever written. Oh, I the can't true, wait. Yeah, the true crime story. It's really terrific. You are you are the president of the International Cinematographers Guild. Yes, um, I am. What does that entail? Um, a lot of politics. No, it it, it really is an honor. Uh, I, I've I've always felt that that part of my job uh, in this lifetime is protecting and advancing the art and craft of cinematography, and. This is a, the International Cinematographers Guild is a trade union, uh, like any others, like you know, uh, plumbers or uh, pipe fitters or uh, carpenters. We are a trade union, and in fact, we're probably the most unionized industry in America today, um, and our union is growing unlike most unions, and uh, it's very successful in that sense. We protect and uh, guarantee um, good lives for our members. Uh, we protect them uh, by, by, by having absolute, developing and demanding absolute safe conditions because it's only a movie, we don't want to hurt anybody. I mean, it's a dangerous business. Um, we guarantee that that people can uh, uh, develop a career and 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 have a pension and welfare and health care and all of the protections that a, a a labor union or trade union is supposed to afford us. And um, we have uh, 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 seven thousand members across the country. Uh, which consists of um, directors of photography, camera operators, camera assistants, uh, digital imaging technicians, uh, still photographers, and we even we even have the uh, publicist, the movie publicist, with us. Uh, hmm. So we have a, a, a great depth of membership uh, all across the country, and uh, we're a very active and involved union. So so my my job as president. I believe is to uh, is is is, uh, is threefold is to continue to to develop the protections of a, of a trade union that that any trade union would have. Uh, it's also, as I said, to to protect and and advance the um, the the art and craft of cinematography, and to uh, look out for the, the 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 welfare of my members. Um, I'm very vocal, uh, and I write a lot, and I speak a lot at uh, at events because I believe we're in the most disruptive period of of of, of the art of uh, and craft of telling stories with movies that's ever existed. Even even sound was not this disruptive. 
uh, I'm not talking. I'm not saying disruptive as as a negative. Uh, I'm just saying that you know it's a disruptive moment in in because everything is changing and everything has changed, and um, we need to um, maintain uh, the the ability to do our work and in ways that does not um, you know because it, it's so easy to pick up a camera and say, okay, I'm a director of photography now. Right, right. You know, but, but in fact, it's much more complicated than that. Um, you know, and, and, and I think what, what, we, what we are doing is we're developing our own best practices in terms of working digitally. Um, computing power, software, and uh, development and, and hardware development have gotten to a point where we can now do all of the front end laboratory work on the set uh, cheaper, better, and faster than by the the traditional ways of of of, of sending the film into the laboratory and waiting for it to the next day. We can do that all on the set and do it mm. cheaper. And faster and better than 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 any of the facilities that uh, that exist. So it's it's a matter of of developing those jurisdictions and uh, maintaining them. Well, you're you're protecting the integrity of the art form, and and I I would think, as you said, that it's that that poses a specific challenge now, since the since cinematography has become so democratized uh, through this new technology. Uh, so that, you know, that's I love that. Work. I, I love that word because because in in fact it's it's democratized because it's it's cheaper to buy a camera, but in fact it still takes the same amount of skill and mm -hmm. ability and intuitive nature to to be able to tell stories.